Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Airs. This is CDR. I'm glad to have everyone here with us and so many people interested in CDR and uh, electrochemical ocean CDR specifically today. Um, we're very excited to present um, This is CDR. It's an online event series to explore the wide range of carbon dioxide removal solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for a policy proposal we have under development for New York and uh, a number of other states and localities at this point. Um, my name is Toby Bryce. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, and I work on CDR policy advocacy with uh, Open Air. And everyone, please, if you haven't already, please introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you are Zooming in from. Um, some quick background on Open Air. We're a distributed volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of CDR solutions uh, essential to solving the climate crisis. Um, we're a global community. Um, we collaborate on shared open source missions in the area of policy advocacy and research and development. Um, there should be a link in the chat to join us, and we please encourage you to do so. Um, we have a lot of work to do, and, and we definitely um, need all hands on deck. Quick background on carbon dioxide removal or CDR. Um, just the definition is pretty simple. It's an activity that removes CO2 from the atmosphere and durably stores it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in long-lived products. It's not point source carbon capture. It's not an emissions reduction. It is removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about CDR, it's really important to just clarify up front that CDR is in no way uh, any sort of substitute for emissions reductions. Um, we have to reduce emissions and decarbonize our economy as quickly and as completely as possible, full stop. No excuses, no substitutions. Um, CDR is very complementary to that. Every Pretty, every credible climate forecast, including in um, very stark terms, the most recent IPCC annual report, um, uh, say that CDR will be required at gigaton scale by mid-century, that's billions of tons per year, um, to account for uh, emissions that are hard to abate or inequitable to abate, and also to um, help us take down the tremendous excess of uh, anthropogenic CO2 we already have in the atmosphere. Uh, the entire CDR industry, it was recently estimated, is currently at kiloton scale, maybe 50,000 tons of CDR all told, and that might even be an overestimate in uh, 2021, so we have a lot of work to do. Um, we'll put a few resources in the chat. There's a logo here for a, a book called the, an online book called the Carbon Dioxide Removal Primer, which is a great comprehensive textbook. Um, the DOE, as part of their CDR Earthshot, recently published some really great um, and very uh, easily comprehended and digestible resources online that I see that Chris just put in the chat. And we'll put a few other links there, but tons of resources out there. Um, also, this series, I think this is episode 16, is a great place to start as well. We're, based, we're covering all sorts of uh, CDR pathways, and um, all of those episodes are available on our YouTube channel. One more piece of quick background. The policy I referenced is now public. It's called the Carbon Removal Leadership Act. Um, it is a state level carbon dioxide removal procurement policy that can be implemented in the context of a state's or a any, any sort of jurisdiction's net zero commitments. And the purpose of the policy is to provide market support to scale durable CDR. Um, as reference, we are at kiloton scale and we need to get gigaton scale. And that's not going to happen without governments getting involved in a big way. Um, the policy is very much centered on equity and environmental justice, which is critical given the fact that the predecessor fossil economy has completely failed on both of those points. Um, the policy is actually about to be introduced into New York's assembly by a very powerful and wonderful assembly member from Albany, New York named uh, Patricia Fahey. And we're making really great progress in a number of other states. Um, uh, California. Um, we should hopefully have some news there soon. Washington, Massachusetts, and Colorado. Again, this is going to be a national and potentially worldwide advocacy effort, and we would love to have your help with it. Um, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Mega, who will introduce today's session and today's speakers. Thanks, Toby. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Mega. I'm also um, part of Open Air's policy work um, based in London, but also working on things out in California, where I am from. This week, we're very happy to welcome Dante Simonetti and Garov Sant from Sea Change to tell us about the company's novel electrochemical CDR process that leverages the ocean's natural carbonate cycles to sequester CO2 at scale. Um, some housekeeping notes as usual. So our format will be a 15 to 20 minute presentation, which we'll follow with some prepared questions and then we'll do moderated audience Q&A. So if you do have any questions, uh, please type them into Zoom's Q&A box. Um, note that that's different from the chat function. So make sure you find the one labeled Q&A. 
The event is being recorded, and so we'll send that video link out to everyone who registered, and we'll also post it to OpenAir's website and to our YouTube channel. We'll also be live tweeting the event. Um, our Twitter link will be in the chat if it's not already, and please follow along with that. Um, if you do tweet, the event hashtag will be hashtag this is CDR. Um, and now for the main event. So Dante Simonetti is an assistant professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering in the Samueli School of Engineering at the University of California, Los Angeles, or UCLA. Um, and the co-founder of Sea Change Inc., the grand prize winner of the Temasek Foundation's 2021 Livability Challenge. Prior to his appointment at UCLA, he was an R&D project leader at UOP Honeywell, where he led the development of several new technologies for multi-contaminant removal from industrial process streams. Dante's expertise is in the area of catalytic reaction synthesis, adsorptive separation processes, and process integration and intensification. Gaurav Ensant is a professor and Samueli Fellow in the Samueli School of Engineering at UCLA, um, and he's also the director of UCLA's Institute for Carbon Management. Gaurav is also a co-founder of Sea Change Inc., um, as well as the co-founder of Concrete AI Inc., the founder of Carbon Built Inc., which is a grand prize winner of the Energy Kosia Carbon X Prize, uh, and a top 10 innovation, global top 10 innovation selected at the International Coop Earth Forum in 2018. Gaurav has served as an expert, providing testimony to the U.S. Senate, U.S. House of Representatives, and the California State Senate. He's also provided strategic consulting, core R&D, and innovation support to Fortune 500 corporations, government agencies, philanthropic foundations, and industry organizations all over the world. Uh, Gaurav and Dante, over to you. I got thank you uh, for the introduction, and uh, I'd like to say that I am happy to be here and participating with today's presentation. If I get my screen up, hopefully everything looks good so far. If not, please feel free to, to let me know. So again, thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to be here today to present uh, some of our work in the area of saline water-based mineralization pathways for uh, gigaton scale CO2 management. I'm certainly here presenting on behalf of many other people, my colleagues in the UCLA Samueli School of Engineering, as well as the Institute for Carbon Management, and also uh, those of us, um, those individuals at Sea Change, uh, working on aspects of uh, this technology. So what I hope to do today is describe at a high level what our process is, and I hope to show everyone the basis for its ability to remove CO2 from the atmosphere through ocean water chemistry. I'll give you a little bit of a, a flavor of what the process actually is. So I'll show you a little bit of, I guess, laboratory scale data. And at the end, we can um, have a discussion on the, the merits of this technology in terms of the, I guess, eight criteria that were discussed, I think, on the uh, previous call um, in terms of its impact on, on gigaton CO2 removal. So this process is inspired by the oceanic carbonate cycle that naturally absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere. So I have a couple chemical equations drawn on this slide here. If we want to focus on how does oceanic, how does the ocean remove CO2 from the atmosphere? Well, it primarily does so, first of all, by establishing a gas liquid absorptive equilibrium, whereby ocean water takes up gaseous CO2 from, from the atmosphere. CO2 can react chemically with the species in water form various species, bicarbonates, carbonate ions, and that's really dependent on the pH of the water solution. Our process focuses on the carbonate ion, and that's this species here, CO3 minus, CO3 two minus which is favored in solutions that have high pHs. And the reason why our process likes this ion is because we want to precipitate out CO2 in species as solids through either magnesium or calcium carbonates, or since there's a high concentration of OH ions around, we can precipitate magnesium out as magnesium hydroxides. And these two solid materials allow us to do mixed carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere. So this can be done, adjusting the pH of water solutions can be done in a number of ways. We can take water solutions, we can concentrate off sodium hydroxide, precipitate that out, and then add it into water to shift the pH. However, that process is energy intensive. What our process does is it leverages in situ base generation via water electrolysis. And this happens, it can happen on 
simple electrode materials in which the cathode stimulates alkalinity generation and precipitation locally. And then at the anode, the, the other half reaction occurs to generate acid. From a practical standpoint, the solids will precipitate out on the metallic membrane, and then we can recover them very easily for a number of different um, discharge methods or, or uses. So what we're going to focus on chemistry from a chemistry standpoint are water electrolysis and then precipitation using the base. And then I'll also discuss how we uh, mitigate the formation of the acid at the anode and then how we deal with also um, potential chlorine evolution that could also occur at the anode. The most important thing about this process is to think about it as a something that's forcing and tin, continuously adding alkalinity. Because when we continuously supply alkalinity, this ensures that the process is in fact net CO2 negative. And well, how do we know this? Well, we can do simple thermodynamic analyses and we can show that, and we can make calculations and show that yes, we do end up removing a certain amount of CO2 per volume of seawater process. And so what I wanna do is I wanna think about this process as really four steps. The figure that I have on the screen here, you know, it's a nice schematic of what a process could look like if it were located just offshore uh, of an ocean. But certainly our process is very flexible and the configurations that both the reactors and the processes can take will be dependent on the location and really the, the end user, the customer who wishes to use it. So um, let's step through these four processes in general and let's understand what's happening and where the CO2 is actually removed. So the first step is at the cathode. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, the cathode performs reactions that generate base, promotes a pH increase, and that stimulates the precipitation of the solids without degassing CO2. And this is a critical point. So if we look at the total amount of dissolved carbon that can exist in seawater as a function of removing alkalinity, so removing calcium or magnesium. So this is the plot on the bottom left here. As we go from left to right on the x-axis, we're decreasing alkalinity. However, if we continually add that alkalinity, uh, continually add OH to restore that alkalinity, we see that at a pH of about nine, we can remove almost all of the calcium or magnesium, but still retain the amount of CO, the ability of that water to, to absorb CO2. So this figure shows that if we maintain a pH above about eight, we will not degas CO2 from the waters on our cathode. I mentioned the anode. On the anode side, yes, there is a pH decrease. And yes, that pH decrease acidifies the water. And on the anode side, we will lose some CO2. But if we look at the amount of CO2 in that water, okay, and that's given on this plot here where we have the amount of CO2 in seawater in equilibrium with air at various pHs, okay, seawater only has about you know, two millimoles of CO2 in that water. So when that amount of water is degassed, okay, we're losing that. However, that's a maximum amount. If we have equal volumes of analyte and catholite, we still precipitate out about five times more CO2 as calcite at our cathode than we do degassing CO2 at the anode. And we can engineer this system to decrease the volume of the analyte relative to the catholite so that we can mitigate this, this degas situation even more. Okay. And so that's just basically a balance of the cathode and anode reactions, only looking at the calcite that's produced. So there's a third step here. After we precipitate out our solids and after we take our catholite, what we have left are an alkaline stream or, or, or a stream that has a pH higher than 12, that's devoid of calcium and magnesium cations. And we have some solid magnesium hydroxide. These species can be discharged back into the ocean. And then over time, this water now will reabsorb CO2. And this leads to the overall net negative process. So we need to envision our water as kind of like a solvent or a, or, or a sponge. Okay, we're putting it in the ocean, it's taking up CO2, we're taking it out, squeezing out the CO2, and then putting it back into the ocean where it can uptake more CO2. And this is our net overall process. 
and we can count the potential amount of CO2 that can be reabsorbed by the magnesium hydroxide we produce simply by looking at the slope of the line of total dissolved CO2 in seawater as a function of increasing calcium and magnesium. And we see that we get you know, approximately 1.5 uh, moles of CO2 removed per mole of uh, magnesium added back into water. And this, this number does range between 1.4 and 1.6, depending on ocean chemistry. Okay, but we can count the CO2 captured or that we would expect to capture from that magnesium hydroxide. And that number is about 83 millimole per liter of, of uh, water that we process. And so we can come up with an overall CO2 removal potential that's about 3.9 kilograms of CO2 removed per meter cubed of seawater processed by our system. This is a number that's, that's based in thermodynamic analysis. Taking into, taking into account all of the chemistry that's involved with seawater and all of the species involved with seawater, as well as the impact of pH on these systems for a cathode operating at constant pH and an anode operating at a lower pH. The final step of our process does involve this acidic stream. I mentioned that on the anode side, we get an acid stream. There's some degas of CO2. We cannot simply release that acid stream back into the ocean because then we will realize a larger extent of CO2, get CO2 degassing. So we need to do something with this stream. This stream, the acid in this stream can be used to stimulate dissolution of alkaline species from a wide variety of solids, whether it be rock, whether it be construction waste, whether it be an industrial waste. And we can restore the pH of this solution back to that of original ocean water. We can further process it with, with commercially available materials such that we're not releasing oxidized chlorine species back into the ocean. And we can return this analyte stream back into the ocean so where it can further take up CO2 and it won't um, disturb any of the um, ocean chemistry. Or at the very least, we have an idea of what this we need to do to this stream to get it as close to what came into our plant as possible. And so for an overall process, what we're doing is we're just taking water out, using it as a regenerable salt. That dissolved CO2 is removed from the seawater, we can uptake new CO2 from the air in a regenerable cycle. And that's really all we are doing here, okay? And we know enough about the, we know enough about electrolysis and we know enough about water purification that we can ensure, or we can at the very least know uh, to a high level, all of the things that we need to do to return this solution back to the ocean. So that way it will, it will minimally disrupt um, seawater chemistry and, and the ecosystem with the goal of not disrupting it at all. So now that I've given you a high level uh, understanding of our process, I hopefully convinced you that it is in fact a C, it's carbon dioxide removal process. I wanna talk a little bit about the energy involved. And because we're using in situ alkylation or in situ alkalinity generated by electrolysis, we can come up with a reduced energy path for CO2 mineralization. And the plot I have here shows energy, what's well, energy intensity. So um, think about this as the amount of energy needed to remove a ton of CO2 at varying, um, as a function of varying volume percents of CO2, so that we get a sense of how this technology compares with other. CO2 removal technologies for other applications. And what we see here is that if we compare our process and we just assume a commercial electrolyzer that can generate a kilogram of hydrogen using 50 kilowatt hours of, of energy and taking the stoichiometry that we need to remove a mole of CO2 from, from air, the uh, O2 to, to CO2 stoichiometry, we can calculate that we need about 45 kilograms of hydrogen to remove a ton of CO2. We can calculate the energy that we need for our process. And that number is about 2.3 kilowatt hour per ton of CO2. So this is the intersection of the yellow area and the blue area on our plot. If we look at recovering hydrogen from this, this number can drop down to about 1.2 megawatt hour per ton of CO2. And if we look at employing more efficient electrolyzers, the number can come down even further. 
So if we compare that to a mineralization process that simply uses sodium hydroxide generated from the chloroalkali process, it's about half. So that number is about 4.5. That can be easily looked up in literature. So that's this blue line up here. Um, chloroalkali, the, the, the thermodynamic minimum for a chloroalkali process is the blue dashed line here. So there is some overlap with ours. However, industrially, we're already about a factor of two. We expect to be a factor of two less than chloroalkali. And this is even lower than using conventional solvent-based approaches to remove CO2 uh, from air, which are represented by the magenta triangles and the, and the green circles um, on our plots here. So there is uh, quite an exciting opportunity to use this technology as a low energy pathway for uh, CO2 removal from air. And even from, as you start looking at implementing this as at uh, potential point source emitters, like at a natural gas plant and a coal plant, you start to see that there is some you know, low energy benefit here to maybe replace a mean scrubbers as well. So now that we have an estimate of what our energy could be, and we know that this could, could work, how does this work practically in the lab? So we've done some lab experiments here where we've taken a reactor that looks like this uh, simple vessel here on the left, and we've tested it at increasing currents. And what we can show you is in fact that over long periods of time, both magnesium and calcium concentrations in our solution decrease to levels that we would expect from our thermodynamic and kinetic analyses, okay? We get removal extents based off of that, that our commensurate with our CO2 removal numbers, and all of these happen at energy intensities, at the target energy intensities that we, that we estimate, because these removal extents are in fact dependent upon our OH generation rate, which is linked to our electrolysis. And because it's linked to our electrolysis, we can look at standard methods for sizing electrodes and therefore sizing our entire plant. So our experiments do follow a Hafel slope relationship where we can lay, relate a cell voltage to a current density, and then we can turn that voltage. Um, we can calculate then the electrode size that we need to meet a target um, energy intensity. In our lab, we practically demonstrated what we'd expect to see from our thermodynamic analyses. And these reactors do in fact follow what we'd expect from a standard electrolyzer. So there's no uh, fancy equipment we need here. The scaling relations are very straightforward and we have a very clear pathway towards scale up for these systems. And we'll say also too, the acid neutralization and the um, oxid oxidized chlorine removal steps are similarly described by engineering correlations that already exist for, for similar technologies. So the scaling relations and the chemistry and the engineering are straightforward for um, growing from a bench scale to a pilot plant to a full scale plant. So um, this is our process in a, at a, in a kind of in a nutshell. It's, rooted in thermodynamics, it's rooted in fundamental chemistry. We have demonstrated the reactor processes, processes in our lab. We know how to scale up and we have a clear path forward. So what, what I wanna do is now address our process in terms of what are the advantages of this mixed mode uh, CDR, so making solids specifically, um, maybe compared to simply just, um, really compared to other processes, but also to compared to maybe just adding hydroxides back into to the ocean, um, where there is a, an advantage in terms of you know, permanence and, and really scale. So this is a, we do have a gigaton scale reaction medium and that's seawater. And we do have a very straightforward scale up pathway that can get us there. Um, we have an indefinite, basically an indefinite storage medium in, in, in solids that are less susceptible to um, disturbances that would impact maybe storing CO2 as a pressurized gas underground or maybe storing CO2 um, as a dissolved uh, bicarbonate. This process is cost competitive and cost effective because we can leverage existing technologies to reduce commercialization timelines. And we can also leverage existing infrastructure for shared capex and opex. So I showed you a earlier a plant that would be built as a standalone new plant on shore. However, 
this technology can also be integrated with any system that utilizes or has any sort of saline waste stream. Specifically, we can integrate it with, uh, with the desalination plant to share some of the processing um, and scale up costs there. Another benefit of this process is that we have three products that we can co-produce. All three of them can be sold into a subsequent market to help offset costs. And really, you know, two of them can be um, used to reduce energy costs for, for processes. Those three products are calcite, hydrogen, and softened water. Calcite can be used as a supplementary building material for customers that are interested in doing this. It can be used in land uh, reclamation processes for customers interested in doing this. Hydrogen is a clean fuel, can be sold into a market where hydrogen is valuable. Also, hydrogen can be used and its energy can be recovered in our process to help offset the energy intensity, as I mentioned uh, a few slides ago. And the third project is softened water. So our cathlite comes out devoid of calcium and magnesium ions. This is a critical step in seawater desalination. By eliminating the step that removes divalence, we now have a feed that can be fed to an RO process and it helps reduce the energy burden um, in this step. And then our process can also then leverage, leverage uh, waste streams in a desal plant to realkalize our analyte stream. So adding additional uh, benefits to um, that iteration of our, of our technology. And finally, uh, you know, sea changes implementable at scale, we can verify its CO2 removal. And um, it really is um, something that is sustainable and equitable when we think about it in terms, of, in terms of where we deploy it and how we deploy it. So this concept of sustainability and, and, and equitability, we don't need any sort of manufactured inputs for our process. We just take seawater and we, take, and we can take renewable electrons, um, which are both plentiful, and feed this into our, into our system. Our system does not require anything that's exotic or expensive in terms of the materials of construction or in terms of a, of a material needed to affect a pH swing. It's all standard technologies and all standard materials that are already commercially available. Um, importantly, this process is meant to exist onshore, can exist offshore, can exist as an integrated part of, of our of, um, industry. So it's not going to compete with, with arable land. It's not going to compete with um, it doesn't need to displace any, anything else for it to operate. Its verifiability is easy. We make a solid and we can weigh the solid, we can analyze the solid, and we can tell you how much carbon is in the solid. We can do a calculation to, to, to estimate how much more CO2 a solid can take out when it's redissolved in water. Okay, so within the boundaries of the plant, we can make a direct measurement of the CO2 removed. We can also, within the boundaries of the plant, make an estimate an indirect estimate of the CO2 removed by analyzing the mineral contents of liquid influence and effluence, and also analyzing the, the composition of gaseous streams. So by keeping an accurate mass balance around our plant, and by knowing the fundamental chemistry involved in our process, we can easily measure this. Okay, now once we get outside the, the boundaries of the plant, this is where we need partners, or we need help in terms of measuring atmospheric CO2, sensing CO2 in the oceans, and that's an incredible, incredibly important part. However, for our technology here, um, we have a very solid way of, of, of measuring it within our plant. Um, and finally, there's this concept of additionality. Uh, would, this, would this CO2 removal happen if our plants weren't up and running? I mean, it, 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 it's uh, quite clear that no, this CO2 removal won't just happen if we idly sit by. Okay, this CO2 re removal is active. Its deployment is dependent upon funding from private and government purchases. And it, it, the growth of a, of a compliance market is mandatory for, for this technology to, to really take off. So it's, it is something that is an, an additional CO2 removal um, above and beyond anything that, that naturally occurs. Um, so I'd like to maybe end the talk with discussing our current state and our next steps. Um, we do have an agreement with Stripe for the purchase of carbon credits generated by our demonstration plants. We are very close to building a series of demo plants that can remove um, CO2. We've got support from these demonstration plants already. 
in progress. We're working on construction and technology de-risking. We have both domestic and international partners to host, um, to host these plants, both as standalone and integrated into a desalination infrastructure. So um, we, are, we are well on our way to you know, hopefully proving and, and de-risking this technology at the, uh, really at the demonstration plant level. So with that, I'd like to um, finish with the slide of our overall process, and I'd be happy to uh, take any questions that uh, people may have. Fantastic, thank you so much. That was great, and it's a, we love to get into the, the technical details, so thank you for providing all that. Um, we're gonna start with a few uh, prepared questions, and then there are tons of audience questions that we will get to, so just a few prepared questions. and. Um, the first one's kind of for Garup too. I don't know if he's going to hop on, but um, can you talk a little bit about where the idea came from? Kind of what was the initial genesis of it? If it's evolved as you've uh, conceived of it, because I think people like to hear where these, where these, where these CDR pathways yeah. begin. You, you know, I I can handle this that question. I I remember I, I still remember the the room in which we conceived this idea, and and all the individuals that were there, and it really came about of how do we tackle. The question was, how do we tackle CO2 at a scale that makes an impact? So this, this so-called gigaton scale. And we started thinking about mineralization reactions, that, you know, ICM at the time, and, you know, at the time, and it still does, have, has a, a deep roots in, in mineralization reactions, reacting CO2 with, with species that contain calcium, magnesium. So there's that fundamental knowledge. And then we thought, well, you know, seawater is really the only thing that's on par with the atmosphere that contains enough calcium and magnesium for us to do this. And then pretty much we had experts in the room for you know, engineering, chemical engineering, electrolysis, water treatment, and this idea of using an, an, an electroactive mesh just um, kind of came up and it's evolved over time as we started to do it. So the, the configurations, the shapes, the conditions, you know, what we're going to form, how we're going to collect it, all of that has, has evolved as we've started to do it in, in, in the laboratory, and it will continue to evolve as we build our plants. And, and, it's, and it's really just a matter of you know, getting a bunch of scientists and engineers in a room together and, and, and putting together, putting their heads together and, and, and creating something new that has a, a lot of advantages from existing parts. Okay, that come together and produce something that's that's really new. So, um, yeah. And when um, the, the conversation or initial series of conversations, when did those happen? Like how long ago? So, yeah, that's um, so I want to say maybe in early 2019. I mean, oh, wow. You know, Garb can, can, can correct me, but it's been, um, it's, been a, it's been a couple of years. The two years. I mean, of, that, like just, given where you are now, I mean, that's that's sort of very inspiring. I um, mean, yes. reference the ICM, and I'm going to identify that. I think we put a link in the chat, UCLA's Institute for Carbon Management. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what goes on there? I mean, it's, it seems like a, a fount of uh, entrepreneurial activity. Um, I, we were talking before the, the Zoom started about how amazing it is to be in LA. Is it LA? Like, well, what is it that uh, <laughs> at the ICM that is uh, sort of generating um, this sort of effervescence? So I will I will turn it over to uh, Garb and let him answer that because you know that would be my answer is is, is Garb is the, the inspiration <laughs> behind everything that we do at ICM so or perhaps he can give uh, what inspires him. Uh, <laughs> Toby, thanks for the question. Happy to try and respond. You know, I I think I think there's a really good group of people working on interesting ideas, and I think the question that we really had, which I think many of many of us. Have, have had for, for a long time, is how do we really make an impact at scale? I think the question of how do you make impact at scale is really the, the, the primary question that has really driven our thinking about what we do. And I think that's really all that it comes to us. It's not, it's any, not anything particularly unique. Got it. And this is a little off script, but um, you know, I, I, in the sort of CDR space, because it is so novel, a lot of the um, activity comes from research institutions. Um, from where you sit in ICM, can you talk about what you see as maybe best practices for commercializing an idea that comes out of a university like ICM or a university setting like mm -hmm. ICM? Because it seems like there are good ways to do it and there are bad ways to do it. And I think there have been a lot of 
bad processes historically maybe. And um, I think that maybe there are a lot of good things happening now with groups like Activate and, um, but can you talk a little bit about that from your perspective? Um, sure, ha happy to try to do so. So, you know, I, I, will, I will preface by saying it's not like we've got a string of successes behind us that we've got any more credibility than anybody else will say this. However, what is clear is that it does require an ecosystem approach. I think this idea of, of you know, single academic, so to speak, trying to create concepts and ideas and taking them to market is very hard, I think, particularly in the carbon management space. So I think building really, I would say, almost coalitions of, of technical leaders, of outside experts, of commercialization and, and business leaders is, I think, really what all of this requires. And I think staying through to that approach of, of having a collective that, that works on translating technology in an impact is really what it takes. And, you know, so the, the act, organizations like Activate, as an example, are really a, an important part of this. Yeah. And so the ecosystem, you know, obviously starts at the university and with the, the generation of new ideas, but it requires a commercial sector, potentially a public sector, and then private capital. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, all right. Back to sea change. Um, you talked to the I'm going to just unpack a couple of things that you um, you did cover in the presentation, but at a high level, can you, so you, your um, life cycle analysis in terms of um, energy efficiency, carbon efficiency, if you had to put a percent on it, um, where it is now and kind of your theoretical um, maximum efficiency, can you talk about what those numbers might be, like per ton of CO2 removed? So um, going back to the uh, number that I quoted earlier, so our realistic achievable target for energy efficiency is about 2.3 megawatt hour per ton of CO2 removed. Yeah. Um, if you're asking what are, what are we currently at in our lab slash at our, at our pilot scale, um, we, we are very confident that we can achieve a, um, twice that with our very first iteration of our pilot plant. Yeah. Um, and we do have high confidence that after operating our pilot plants, well, we will be able to get to this number, this 2.3 number. And if you're using renewable electrons, then the carbon efficiency is 100. Are there other, yeah. um, are there other uh, emissions associated with your process that would take it below 100? So there are no other emissions associated with our process that would take it below 100 if we are using renewable electrons. So just be the embodied carbon in your plants that you would just need to measure. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, embodied carbon yeah, in, in, in our plants. I think that there's this this number is very small. Um, okay. And then in terms of your plants, can you talk a little bit, and if this is confidential, don't answer it, or you can answer it sort of generally, but what kind of form factor are we talking about? Like how, how big is one of your units going to be? Is it a complex of modules that a single unitary plant of a certain size? Um, maybe talking about it in terms of, you know, tons of, of carbon removal over time, or if there's another more convenient metric. You know, um, I, I will say that it, it's it's a mixture of both, and it you know will really will be dependent on the on the scale at which one builds a plant like this, which is also dependent upon the the location of installation. If we're just talking about you know a standalone plant, we're talking about modules of. We're, we're, it is in fact modular, but those modules modules can be larger or smaller, I okay. guess, depending on the, the, the amount of CO2 to be removed by this by this plant. Um, okay. So that's the that's really the electrochemical reactor cell. Right. All of the extra, or I, I would say all of the supporting pieces of equipment, so the realkalization chambers, pumps, those types of things, well, those do in fact grow with size okay so those would be those would be less modular but those are also minor components when i say minor minor relative to the electrochemical reactors themselves so the reactors will be modular and then the other supporting and apparatus would potentially other, be larger and unitary to scale with process. yes unit unitary to uh, to scale but those are um you know nothing um those themselves are are they're going to be small enough that they're not necessarily when you think about you know, scaling something in size when you think about maybe scaling like a like a power plant and the secondary units you know grow enormous these are small enough that they're it's not necessarily something that's going to be enormous relative to our plants 
and, and so the, the form factor of the sort of maybe ideal size of the reactor, like how much, how much seawater is it processing per unit of time to remove what quantity of carbon? Um, so we're looking at, um, so that's at this point, um, what we would say is something that would process at least, you know, 5,000 cubic meters per day of seawater would be our module size. Mm -hmm. And then going from there, multiplying it by N to now achieve varying scales is what we would like to push toward. And the five and the five thousand cubic meters of seawater results in how much carbon removal? It's approximately uh, uh, it's, a, it's more than a ton. It's a pr approximately a ton. Approximately so ton we, order. Right? So okay. we we require um, so it's about. 20 meter cubed, a little less than 20 meter cubed of CO2 for, an, uh, for a small demo plant that's on the order of you know, tens of kilograms a day. So we're looking at, you look about it to get to a ton, you're looking at in the order of 5,000 you know, 5, meter cubed a day. Okay. Um, two more quick questions and let's get to the audience questions. And these are both a little bit of recap, but I think they, they could be helpful for people. Um, so if, if for folks who spend any amount of time on sort of climate Twitter or ocean CDR Twitter or the CDR Google group, um, there was a little bit of controversy when your process first became publicized that I think stemmed to some extent from the way Fast Company framed it, talking about making seashells. Um, can you just at a high level explain how the, how the oceanic carbonate cycle and the formation of sea cells will actually emit CO2 and then how your process doesn't? Yeah, so I want to correct myself here. I was an order of magnitude off, but what's an order of magnitude amongst friends? It's, it's about 500 meter cube per day is, is, our, is our smallest, is our biggest module. So okay, correct that first. Um, you know, I was hoping that my that most of the talk you know, covers covers. It, it did. I just think so, that like maybe people. So I, I, I think that it's well, so seawater chemistry is well understood. It's well known and well proven many times in literature that it is, you will not emit CO2, you will not degas CO2 if you continuously add alkalinity, okay? Um, you will not change the pH of the ocean or not acidify the ocean if you neutralize the anode stream and we can neutralize this by dissolving rocks and um, for, as an example to, to prevent this. So those types of things, and, and again, well-known chemistries, okay, ensure that it is a CO2 removal process. Now, yes, I agree if we take a batch of seawater and I just remove alkalinity without doing anything else, then yes, you get this, this sort of um, you know, calcite pump or reverse pump, but that's abated by our process where we force alkalinity. Um, okay. And then, then the comment is, well, why not just store it as bicarbonates? Because you need only need half of the you only need half of the alkalinity to store it as bicarbonates and you double your CO2 capacity. Well, there are some distinct practical advantages to, to having solids, um, both in terms of co-production of co-products, in terms of flexibility of, of deployment, um, and in terms of you know, just handling of, of materials. And also it's it's you know having a solid, solid species are less susceptible to you know any sort of other event that would happen that might uh, perturb a, a liquid phase or a compressed um, store. Got it. Cool. Um, I think Mega is ready to uh, to process the many audience questions we have. So I'm going to hand it over to her. Hey, Mega. Just one thing. I I would try and make this simple and give everybody a chance. Hopefully, I've tried to respond to some of the questions as well. So. Yeah, no, great. Thanks for doing that. I think also, I think the ones you responded to are quite sort of pointed specific ones. So I'll try to stick to the ones that are a little broader and might be interesting to the bigger group. Um, but cool. Thanks for doing that. Um, cool. So I think one of the main questions that we that we always get, um, which I think you've addressed a bit, but it's probably good to still go over is just, um, can you talk a little bit more about the overall ecosystem effects of this? I know you talked a bit about, you know, the uh, acidity effects, but anything 
um, related to how this affects um, organisms in the areas, you know, like microorganisms that might be sort of put through the process itself, other organisms and marine life that live nearby, um, just other ecosystem effects that you might observe and how you're going to how you're going to be able to measure and sort of potentially mitigate those. So yes, that, that's an important question. I think that that implies that applies to any sort of system that's going to utilize the oceans and really any system in general where you're looking at you know, terraforming. Really. What we're talking about is terraforming. Um, and, and, and this is something where we would work closely with a with a partner, partners, and we do and we do work closely with partners um, to study theoretically what the impact would be. Okay. And then also asking questions with these partners, what are your methods that you use to start to do to assess these impacts? Um, from our side, if you look at this as being inside and outside the plant, it's our responsibility to understand our process in, in, in great detail. So we know all the inputs and all the outputs. That's how, that's how we can provide specific information partners that would then look at our effluents and then would then tell us, well, here's your, here's the range with which you can perturb this stream. Here's the range with which you can perturb this stream. Here's the range with which you can perturb this stream. Okay. And then they can say, okay, well, I'm going to set up a sensor here, here, and here at your outputs to monitor these critical, um, these critical parameters, pH, concentrations, and those all things happen in the short term. Um, and then, you know, long term, it's just a matter of, I mean, doing things that, that, that uh, oceanographers and, and, and people that's in that, not oceanographers, but ocean scientists and, and um, people in those spaces do already. So monitoring, monitoring um, pH, monitoring concentrations, observing, wildlife, um, observing you know, biodiversity and things of that nature. I think it's our responsibility and it's the responsibility really of anyone developing technologies to know their processes in great detail so that way they can provide that information to them. Yeah, makes sense. Are there any, are there any particular sort of areas where you're focused on monitoring and kind of making sure you keep an eye or is it just sort of a broad pH, spectrum? So pretty much everything. Right now, pH, and stream, uh, pH of all the streams that we're liquid streams we're emitting um, concentrations of chlorine gas and all the gaseous streams we're emitting, concentrations of hydrogen and all the gas streams we're emitting, um, concentrations of, of you know, calcium and magnesium in all the liquid streams we're emitting, but also concentrations of other species that may exist in our solid streams that we dissolve into our anode. Um, so what heavy metals exist in these streams? How Readily do they dissolve out under acidic conditions? Um, do they show up in our liquid streams and in what form? Do they perturb anything? Do they, do they change the form of any other ions that are, that are in here? So it's really just a very detailed accounting of, of um, species in and out. So I would say, is there anything specific? I would say everything coming in and out of our plant. Okay. need to keep an eye on. Yeah, makes sense. Um, we had a couple of questions about sort of the fluxes bet between the atmosphere and the ocean of carbon dioxide. So um, in terms of how quickly that happens and how how long the time scale is between sort of your process taking effect in the ocean and then that flowing through to Im impact on the atmosphere. Is that something you've studied as well? Well, we're very much aware of the of the um, studies out there that, that take into account time scales of mixing. Um, I will say that uh, so we, I, we don't really, I, I don't want to say that we assume everything. I think there was a question on there that says we assume rapid reequilibration. Um, rapid reequilibration, yeah, it, it, it's needed for, again, anything we're working with the ocean and we're working with a global system. You know, all we can do is assume rapid reequilibration to see if it's worthwhile studying. Okay, now if we assume rapid reequilibration, then yes, this, this process works. If rapid reequilibration doesn't happen, then that's, I think, a bigger problem. That's a, that's a problem that I don't think, I'm certainly not qualified. I'm a chemical engineer. I'm, I'm qualified to build this plant and then, again, give that information to, to uh, people, you know, for example, at o Ocean Visions and talk to them about timescales, okay? Now, what can I do if someone comes and tells me, oh, it's going to take a week to readjust? 
I mean, if I have, if I'm constrained to that, I will dial down my plant to give that re-equilibration of wheat. Okay. Um, I, I think that that's kind of what we do as engineers on the other side, developing technologies, come up with something that we know will work and then maybe turn a knob and be prepared to be flexible if someone outside of the walls of our plant says, oh, you need to slow down. Um, and, and again, I think that that goes with um, pretty much any, any technology that's going to leverage oceans or, or leverage um, something that's global. Okay, got it. We had a few questions about placement of these devices. So someone was asking, um, do you see them being placed on shore versus in the sea? Um, one person asked if you could fit them onto ships so that the hydrogen that could that's generated could be used by the ships. Um, someone asked if it could be used in rivers. So how do you think about placement and what makes the most sense for this process? Yeah, so I, I this is, um, I like this question and, and, it, and I think it speaks to kind of a general theme that I've been getting at is this process is flexible, very flexible. So we can put it, so the answer to that is yes, we can put it offshore or we can put it just offshore and have it operate on seawater coming in. We can put it offshore with, uh, on, on, on some form of platform where we have wind or solar, we can put it on a ship. Um, we can utilize this, the hydrogen in, in, in any sort of way, um, in any sort of location. We can integrate these into um, any industri existing industri industrial process to leverage saline streams and CO2 emissions. So, so this is, a, this is a very flexible process and it allows us to, to if we need to deploy in a distributed manner. Um, so that being said, I think that it's just kind of, you know, up to perhaps up to the market to see which sector is most motivated to deploy this technology. And I think that'll, that will drive the size and the location that we, that we deal with. Got it. Yeah, makes sense. Um, we had a couple of questions just asking to compare your process to other approaches, um, you know, in the mineralization category um, or to planet hydrogen, just to kind of other similar things that are out there. Could you just maybe kind of break down the advantages and disadvantages of each and how yours kind of fits in? Well, I think that the, the, the key aspect of ours is we're, 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 we're looking at seawater as a reaction medium. Okay, seawater, it, it really, really is. It's, it's a, as I mentioned before, it's, it's a regenerable solvent. We've come up with a, a way to engineer the regeneration of this solvent in a very energy efficient manner. So I think that that's really the, the, dis, the distinguishing feature. The, the purposeful production of solids is another distinguishing feature of our system and, and, and how we do this in an energy efficient way. Um, and, 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 what we can then do with the solids and how we can deploy this system. Those are the, those are the distinguishing, really the distinguishing features. Um, so we're not looking to, um, you know, we're not looking to, ex our, our primary purpose isn't to extract reagents from the land and maybe put them into the ocean. It's not really ocean deacidification. It's more or less a using alkaline water as a reactive absorbing solvent for or any CO2 containing gaseous stream. Makes sense. Um, I know we're almost out of time. I'm just gonna finish with a couple more questions. Um, one person, uh, a bunch of people have asked a bit about scaling up and kind of what that entails. So do you see any big challenges to scaling up and kind of, um, you know, whether that's regulatory or in materials or permits or regulations, um, what would be kind of the areas where you're looking to push past some barriers there? Yeah, so the technological scale up, scale up, as I mentioned, is straightforward, but it is, it is the scale up barriers are in terms of, of permitting and, and, and regulatory um, information. Um, right now, I don't, I don't know if there is any sort of policy on, first of all, ocean-based carbon capture. So what does it mean? What counts as carbon capture? How do we count it? Um, so that's one big um, hurdle that we need to sort out that would... Um, is required for this deployment at scale. Um, again, permitting. Permitting is a big thing for deployment at scale. Um, how do we convince the various stakeholders that live in these areas that this process is something that we should build? Uh, another one is, I think, I think partnerships. Um, we need to get this technology de-risked such that, I, I mentioned industry partners many times, we need to get this de-risked so that those industry partners are happy with us coming in and 
in integrating this within their existing infrastructures um, in a manner that doesn't disrupt what their core business is, desalination. Um, any sort of anyone that has produced water and, and, and a CO2 gaseous stream. And those would be the, the, the three big areas that uh, we need to look at when we talk about scale up. Yeah, could you talk about what kind of policies or regulations might actually help? Like what kind of things would actually help you, you know, scale up and um, what would you like to see pass to make that possible? Well, I, th I think the growth of, the, of, a, of a compliance market would, would help. So, so clarity on who can purchase CO2 credits, how are those credits going to be handled? Um, do they apply to ocean capture? Um, that's, that's a big area that uh, once that happens, I think you'll start seeing a lot of these things move forward. Um, rules around, again, rules around carbon accounting for ocean-based capture. That's another big one. How do we come up with a way to say yes? You know, when I, when I you know, walk out of my plant with a you know, bag full of calcite, you know, how much will they give me credit for for how much I caught from the air? So those are the types of things that will start to, and, and, and they'll come, they'll come with time. Um, but once those happen, I think you, you, you'll really start seeing a lot of these processes start to um, start to become more prevalent and, and grow. Makes sense. Um, cool. And then just for everyone here, you know, if they're interested in learning more, getting involved, what's the best way for them to sort of um, support your efforts or just find out more going forward? Well, I, I would say broadly speaking, I, you know, participating in, in events um, like uh, like this you know, weekly seminar, open air go-outs, you know, find out as much about various technologies as possible, um, understand them, understand that there's going to be a lot of different technologies that are going to be required because this is a nuanced problem. And, um, you know, just, just keep a big tent because we'll be operating several of these, you know, a lot of these things will be operating out there to all help remove um, CO2. And then uh, I think like Toby said at the top of the call, it's going to take removal, it's going to take emissions reductions. Um, it's going to take out everything out of that basket. So just, just learn as much as possible about everything and kind of keep an open mind about how these things can, um, can work. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, this has been great and super interesting to me. Um, I will just hand it back to Toby who can close us out, but really appreciate you guys, be appreciate you guys being here. Yep. Thanks, Mega. And Gaurav and Dante, thank you so much for being with us today. It was I really appreciated the detail that you guys went into and you sharing um, what you've been working on. It's super impressive and exciting. So thank you for being with us. And um, thank you all to the audience for 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 joining as well and for the um, excellent questions. Um, just a few programming notes about what we have coming up. Um, next week, it came up a couple times during the presentation and during the chat, um, we have another uh, electrochemical ocean CDR process, planetary hydrogen based up in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia. Um, Mike Kelland, who's our CEO, is going to be with us. Um, we're going to take a couple week break for the, for the holidays, and then we'll be back on uh, the first Tuesday in January of the new year with a very special program um, with our own Chris Nidal and Naeem Merchant to talk about um, direct air capture and concrete and how together they can um, result in a, a scalable and really important CDR process, particularly in the near term where, at least in North America, geologic sequestration of CO2 is pretty limited. Um, so there's a, and we have, we're going to continue the series in 2022 and we'll be announcing the schedule soon. Um, here's a nice picture of Mike who will be with us in uh, Gaurav and Dante's seat next week. Um, so thank you all for being with us. Uh, there should be, we're going to leave the um, screen up for a few minutes because there are tons of links in the chat. Um, follow Gaurav on Twitter. There's a link to the Sea Changes website. Dante, I don't believe you are on Twitter. God bless. Um, and, uh, and our Twitter and join open air are both in the chat. So Thanks again, everyone. Be well, take care, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.